Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and today we're continuing our conversation about Egypt. Uh, last week we talked about resurrection and the cult of the dead and the difference between the Egyptian idea of burial and resurrection and the Christian and biblical idea of burial and resurrection. Today, we're going to shift our focus over to the pyramids. Uh, We've talked a little bit about them before in our episode on the Tower of Babel, which I'm going to recommend you go back and listen to. We're going to build a little bit on that foundation today. And please don't take my pun amiss, because it was not (laughs) super intentional, only moderately intentional. There's got to be a pun for moderately intentional, too. The Great Pyramid is, as we know, is the last of the seven wonders of the world. Here are some statistics. It contains at least 2.3 million stone blocks, each weighing on the average two and a half tons. Each of its bases is 230.4 meters long, with an average error and length of only 58 millimeters. Its sides are oriented toward the four cardinal compass points within four minutes of an arc. The pyramid's height was originally 146.5 meters, making it the tallest man-made structure on Earth for more than three millennia. The ratio of its perimeter to its height is very close to 2 pi, although archaeologists disagree on whether this is intentional or an unintentional result of the means of construction. I have a little more to say about that later. But either way, the Great Pyramid remains a technological marvel, so marvelous that beginning when I was in, well, about junior high, I guess, people began to speculate about its extraterrestrial origins. <laughs> Eric von Dadigan wrote a little book called Chariots of the Gods, where he introduced, maybe not for the first time, but he popularized the idea of aliens coming to our planet in our early history or prehistory and teaching our ancestors how to make marvelous things that we couldn't possibly do because, and so the logic runs, we can't do them now, which is true. <laughs> So obviously, given evolutionary theory and the inferiority of our ancient ancestors, they sure couldn't. So either extraterrestrial help, demonic help, divine help, magic. Not long ago, one of the the younger kids in, in our school, which is a Christian school, made some remark in a test paper or something about the pyramids. They were put together by magic, weren't they? No, oh my they, goodness. They, they, they weren't. <laughs> no, um, they, they, they are a human construct, but they were done with a great deal of energy, precision, and some technological tools that we do not currently use, and therefore it looks very mysterious toward us. There's a man whose story you can find on the internet. I think it dropped off for a while, but I just look and it's back again. His name is Wally T. Wallington. Yes. I I love him. (laughs) He is from Michigan. I don't know if he still lives there. He did carpentry and construction work for 35 years. And in his backyard, he is or was building Stonehenge. Now, understand, this is not a modified scaled down version. This is a full-size replica of Stonehenge. And what's marvelous is that he's doing it by himself. He is moving the kinds of stones that make up Stonehenge, and he's not using any kind of machinery, as we think of machinery today, that is nothing electric or diesel or gas-powered or anything like that. All the machines are simple machines, levers, pulleys, sand as counterbalance and ballast, and he is able to move these huge stones very, very simply, and it, at least uh, I, I think the the footage of him moving it is still online. Mm-hmm. And you watch and you say, wow, that's just remarkably easy. And Wally jokes that, no, he's not a man in black. He's not an alien. <laughs> and that's just is, what he wants us to think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, he actually shows how it works, and it does indeed work. Uh, and in the original version that I saw, he called his grandchildren out of school to, uh, so they could watch him put the final, final touches on one, one stage in what he was doing. 
And his son reports, yeah, Gat's out here just doing weird stuff, and we kind of leave him alone. But this was this was a big important deal. And we did uh we did help him move the entire barn this way not too long ago. <laughs> the, the point here, and in Wally T. Wallington. Go look that is my up. favorite part of the story, is that his name is Wally T. Wallington. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it. The fact that that when modern engineers look at the pyramids and say, we can't do that, means they're thinking like modern engineers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we don't, the, the, the kind of machines that we use can't move these stones, they're too huge. But... Wally has found a way of moving similar stones. And I've heard protests, well, the Egyptian sand is different and conditions are different, so this doesn't help. No, maybe this isn't the way the pyramids were built, but it does show that the same kind of logic that was once used on Stonehenge, those stones are massive. They had to have been moved by Merlin's magic. Um, (laughs) That doesn't, if it doesn't hold there, maybe it doesn't hold here either. Maybe there is something that involves the simple machines the ancient world knew only so well. Uh, Pulleys, levers, stones as pivots, as balances, sand as ballast, that actually could move these stones a whole lot faster than we know. So we, 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 we can step safely away from all of that, from the magic and the aliens, and, and we can ask hoping that at some point somebody with some with some um, engineering sense will go back and say, wait, let's start over. If I were going to do this, and I'd watch Wally's video, how could I go about it? And I'll actually come up with an answer. In the meantime, uh, a, a more to the point question, at least for us, since we're not engineers, is not how did they do it, but why did they do it? And and that's, that's a huge <clears throat> thing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of hard to avoid the puns, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Now we we can we, get to the point. <laughs> uh, uh. Except the point of the thing isn't there anymore. It's been removed. According to tradition, there was something uh, pyramid shaped that sat on the very top, something sparkly that that um, you could see for great distances in the in the wilderness. But we we've talked about this. I think you mentioned um, when we talked earlier about ziggurats. The roots are in the in the um, Garden of Eden, which was on a mountain plateau of some sort. The scripture says that a river came out of Eden, watered the garden, and from thence it was parted and came into four heads. And the four directions, at least given the map that we know, which may not be all that particularly accurate for the ancient world, the antediluvian world, uh, were not all in the same direction. So to get water to flow from point A to points B, C, and D, which are kind of not in the same direction, the water needs to start kind of at a high altitude and then plummet and plunge and break and, and, and move. So whereas Genesis does not say in so many words that the Garden of Eden sat on a mountain, it's, it's certainly implied. When we get to Ezekiel, the prophet explicitly calls it the mountain of God. Now, as we walk walk through the rest of Scripture, we found Sinai or Horeb. We found we find Zion and um, Moriah. The Tabernacle and Temple. The Tabernacle is a replica of of Sinai. Architecturally, it's designed symbol, symbolically to be a stacked building with the outer court on the bottom, and then the holy place, and then the holy of holies on top. The Temple also not only uh, encapsulated Mount Zion, but when David moved the ark from Zion to Moriah, where the temple was, uh, or Solomon did, Zion moved with it. Throughout mm-hmm. the Psalms, the temple mountain is called Zion, but it wasn't, except when David was alive. And so the whole temple thing becomes, it, it was physically Mount Moriah, but symbolically it becomes Mount Zion. It becomes the seat of the size kingdom. And then when we get to the New Testament, we find the Mount of Transfiguration, we find the Mount of Olives, and finally the New Jerusalem, which is either a huge cube or, again, a huge mountain or pyramid. And and, and the reason God deals in very simple symbols. You know, you, you, you show a kid a tree, and we can think of my Mary Ellen here, or actually Haley was the one who did it most. You show Haley a tree when she was a, a little girl, you know what she did? Did she climb she, it? She climbed it. <laughs> and she. one of her great regrets about the house we live in now is that there were no climbing trees. 
and her later childhood was lived without any climbing trees. And that's what mountains are for. You climb mountains. Why? To get up high. Why else would you do it but to get higher than other people? To reach out and, and touch the sky. And the sky itself, uh, God called the sky heaven because the sky is an image and replica of the highest heaven, God's throne room. The, uh, the sapphire blue, the clouds, the thunder, the singing, flying things, the bright lights, mm -hmm. the rainbow. All of these things are things that in the book of Revelation, we see all about the throne room of God. And so in the ancient world, as they thought of turning their backs on Yahweh and pursuing their own road into divinity, they thought in terms of the Garden of Eden. When, when, we, went to, when we went to get away from God, we use God's thought forms to do it. <laughs> You're probably familiar with Van Til's illustration. He was in a train once, and he saw a little girl who was very upset with, with her grandfather. But she was very little, and she wanted to hit her grandfather, so she climbed up in his lap so she could slap him. <laughs> when we want to assault God, we have to climb into his lap, as it were. And So here we have the ancient world saying... Well, you want to talk about the mountain of God. You want to talk about Eden. Watch us. We'll make our own. Mm -hmm. And there's the point. By technology, by magic, which in the ancient world were not necessarily different things, our pagan ancestors wanted to create a stargate, a way of reaching divinity, a tower whose top was unto heaven. Yes, symbolically, and these things were very tall, but more than that, as magical artifacts, they were to open religiously, magically, a way into the very presence of the gods, into, into deity. And so they symbolize man's ascent out of chaos into the perfect order of the divine. And the one who would stand at the pyramids, at the top of the pyramid, symbolically speaking, would be the priest king, the son of the gods, son of the divine son, if you're in Egypt, who lays on, lays hold of of heaven with one hand and of earth with the other and brings them together. And because of this, because he provides order in the midst of chaos, he must be obeyed absolutely. Because everything that we need, our, our civilization, our social structure, the flooding of the Nile on a regular basis, the fertility of our crops, everything depends upon this man who can talk to the gods, who is in fact deity himself. And uh, just from a symbolic and mystical level, here are some reasons for building pyramids, building cigarettes. But there's something else that we need to talk about. There's a quote, and it, it doesn't specifically mention the pyramids, but it's it has them in mind. It says, <laughs> whenever you do something, make sure you do such a good job at it that thousands of years afterward, people think you had to have the help of aliens. <laughs> I wish I had done anything in my life with such zeal. <laughs> not there yet. We don't know yet. We have to wait a couple thousand years for. <laughs> That's look true. Back. Time will tell. Yeah, when when uh, our technology lays in the dust, evaporating into its basic elemental gases, and people come and find what we've done, and they can, and they can find no trace of plastics and metals, let alone electricity and nuclear power. How did they communicate such great distances? How did they put man on the moon? We thought it was just a myth, but look, there are footprints up here. What are these things they referred to called phone nays? <laughs> <laughs> Allow them to throw their voice thousands of miles and pictures too. Uh, but all the while, these, th these phone nays were deceiving them and uh, never mind. <laughs> but another phone nay was created. <laughs> A phony phone? Mm -hmm. Anyway, something else, though, another practical thing. And, and I came across this, I think, first in a book called The Riddle of the Pyramids by an engineer named Kurt Mendelssohn, uh, which is not my recommendation, but it could be. I don't know what his title is. Let me see. FRS. I don't know what that means. But he's an engineer, and um, he, like like others, was, was trying to figure out what these things were all about. Why pyramids? Now, 
the people who dabble in, myth in modern mythologies, space aliens and such, try to insist that the pyramids um, could not be built by any technology we know and so forth, and therefore they must have taken centuries to build. But Mendelssohn points out there's at least one pharaoh, and his name is Snofro, fourth dynasty king, who actually built three pyramids during his reign. And here's, and here's what Mendelssohn noticed. The first pyramid was completed, and then it collapsed. Hmm. The second one was halfway built, and it was beginning to it was be, it was reaching a danger point. See what happened with the first one was it was too steep. Mm. It was so steep that the it couldn't support the weight and it just fell. By the time the second one was being built, it set, the we have the pyramid and the angle of the what do you call them, the walls, the exterior shifted in dramatically. So rather than this nice straight side, you have this well, we're going up and now we're going in. We're going in. We're going in. <laughs> nice and nice and we're sloping in. And then the third pyramid uses that same gentler slope. Mm. They all belong to the same thing. Lesson, uh, the pyramids were being produced fast enough and one on top of the other. That is at the same time before the first one was finished. Mm -hmm. The second one was being built and at such a, at such a speed that... The first one collapsed, and there was still time to alter the plans on the second one. And then there was still time to do a third one, having learned in the middle of the second one the right angle for, for, the, for the construction. Now, what this means, over against all the assumptions we've made that every pharaoh made one pyramid, which would be his burial place for all eternity, here's a guy who we can show made three of them. Presumably, he was not intent on cutting his body into three parts. <laughs> and putting it in three different pyramids. So what uh, Mendelssohn does is to raise the question, what were they really doing then? He didn't need three of them, but he built three of them. And even when the second one was stable, he still went on and built a third one. And he kept the laborers working all the time. Why would you do that? It's not to create a burial site. There has to be another point. And as Mendelssohn thinks through it, and he's, I don't believe, he doesn't, to me, suggest that he's a theologian or even particular philosopher, very practical man. But what he comes up with is the building itself was the goal. Mm -hmm. You keep people working so that you can keep people working. Why does the state want to keep people working all of the time? Well, it establishes... Uh, within the community of, of philosophy, a an inbred notion that this is the way things work. You do your crops in the growing and reaping season, and in the down season, you go and you work on the federal works program, hmm. and you you give your time in your life to the state for the good of the state. And the more you do this over successive years, decades, and eventually generations, the more it becomes an inbred habit of, oh, but this is what we've always done. This is what dad did. This is what granddad did. Where we are people who build pyramids and look at the glory of Egypt, look at our glory as citizens of Egypt, because we're constantly building these things. Hail Pharaoh. Reminds me of the Winchester Mystery House. Yes. <laughs> In the sense of keep things going. Yeah. But she at least was crazy. Um, oh. And was responding, well, wait, to spirits. Okay, maybe. Um, for those You of, had no faith in me. <laughs> for those of you who don't know what the uh, Winchester Mystery House is, it's this weird complex or extended house. What, what city is it near? Santa oh, something. Oh, goodness. Yeah, somewhere in Central California. You know, you see signs for it on the freeway. Um, Santa back. Clarita? Sorry? Sorry. I'm, no worries. I was guessing at the city name. I am Googling it. You it is Googling. outside of San Jose. San Jose. Oh, San Jose. Okay. Yeah. thought it was just a little further north. Um, this, uh, this older lady started hearing knocking sounds in and about her house. And uh, they kept up, and she couldn't find, figure out what was going on. So she went to a medium, 
who told her that these were the spirits of the Indians, Native Americans, who had been killed by her husband's invention, the Winchester repeating rifle. And the gun the way, that won the West. The gun that won the West. The way to keep these spirits silent was to keep the noise of carpentry going in the house 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the rest of her life. And so when you visit the house, it's just a rambling complex of stairways that go nowhere or, or, or doors that open up on blank walls and so on, because she didn't care. There was no plan. But this is what the spirits wanted, perpetual movement, perpetual noise, perpetual work. And somebody got a good job out of this. <laughs> now, I think the, the medium was on some local contractor's pay. Yeah, it sure <laughs> sounds like it. Because let, let's, let's, let's it we'll get real. Follow the money. What's going on here? Why does – it's one thing to say Pharaoh wanted this huge symbol – that represented his own divinization. Oh, that's great and fine. Why not draw a big picture on a wall or a mountain or something? There, there's something else going on here. And what that is, is the creation itself of the very state political organization that the symbol points to. It got the Egyptian people in the mindset of thinking the state constantly provides work for us when we're there, it feeds us and takes care of us. From what we've found in the archaeological ruins uh, is evidence that the people actually, the various villages competed with one another and they had their own teams and their own mottos and their own totems and, you know, go turtles, go cows, things like that. <laughs> uh, and and it, they made it this, this great contest and this great exciting event. But... What's happening is the people are being conditioned to be wards of the state and being, first and foremost, sons of Egypt and servants of the divine Pharaoh. This is a public works program with a vengeance. But if you think back to the 1940s and to Franklin Delano Roosevelt's New Deal, you see something that wasn't so far removed. In the middle of the Great Depression, uh, people needed work. They needed money. And rather than bite the economic bullet and say, let's let prices do their thing. And yes, it's going to be tough. And you need to show some love and kindness to one another and churches step up your act here um, and letting it balance out as every other depression in American history had within two years. He said, well, we will save you. We will create this new deal that will provide public works, and we will give you jobs on them so that we will now give you the jobs and the money and the point and the sense of purpose that you're lacking right now, and we will do this as long as it takes, which was quite a while as it turned out. But if you go back in time, and my parents belonged to that generation, although my dad had no respect at all for FDR, but that generation in general, if you spoke ill to them of FDR, you would have the wrath of God upon you. No, he was our savior. He rescued us. He saved us. He gave us public works, WPA, Works Project Administration. And when, when, when no one else would, rather than trust God and rather than submit to constitutional law, let alone divine law, the American people turned to the state and asked for a public works program to rescue them. And in this respect, we were not too far removed from what Pharaoh was doing with the Egyptians. And of course, the thing is that we've never undone that. There's no going back mm -hmm. and saying, let's now get rid of that mentality. Let us be super diligent to teach our children. That was a mistake, or at least that was a special thing. Don't expect this. Mm -hmm. Rather, what we have taught people is, well, of course, this is how things are done. And... Um, in, in the wake of some of the things that have been happening lately in, in um, the headlines, we're still getting the, let's have the government step in and fix it. It has laws, it has money, mm -hmm. but there's no going back short of true revival and true reformation, a true return to God's word. We become, what is the word, inured to uh, the loss of our freedom. We become habituated 
to thinking in terms of a state that will provide for us, that will accomplish great things, and we will glory in them. And we'll never stop and ask, but wait, if we had done this in the free market, would we have done this? Hmm. Or would we have done something far more efficient and useful? <laughs> yeah, we've been looking at uh, laser eye surgery lately because David's eyes are quite far from perfect vision. And it's just incredible how cheap it's become and how reliable it's become. And that's because it's been developed in this situation where there is competition over it. There's, it's, it's very much a private industry product. And just contrasting that to stories I hear about the Canadian healthcare system and even, <laughs> you know, the rest of our healthcare system is no. pretty far from an actual free market. That's interesting. I didn't know the price was coming down. If I live long enough, maybe I can uh, <laughs> profit from it as well. <laughs> well, that was that was the thing that surprised me. I lost the previous pair of glasses to the one that I have now and ended up needing a replacement with the prescription that I had. And I was shocked, shocked, I tell you, to see <laughs> that this pair would cost me less than less than one hundred dollars because when you do it through uh, eye insurance and you go first to the you know the optometrist however that gets covered but even even just for the glasses we were expecting it i was expecting to be so much more and this was done apart from insurance entirely mm -hmm. yeah the the free market wonderful thing i i i believe brian that one of your uh recommendations a few episodes back was in fact free market <laughs> capitalism. capitalism yeah yeah yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah egypt didn't do that Egypt's whole the whole uh, economy, lifestyle, sociology of the Egyptian people was directed from the top down. I have a quote from uh, Max Faber, the, the German sociologist, in a speech in 1909, just, just a passing remark he makes. To this day, there has never existed a bureaucracy which could compare with that of Egypt. That's interesting. Mm. Uh, he didn't know probably as much as we know today about the pyramids, but he can look at a pyramid and say, wow, how do you get a bunch of people to do that? <laughs> yeah. uh, you, need, you need to be able to communicate information very quickly, very accurately. And then you need to make sure that people along the way don't get inventive. <laughs> well, I know he said blue, but chartreuse is just so me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, none of this do tomorrow, do tomorrow stuff. It's no, it's going to be done by the time the sun climaxes. So get with it. There was an incredible top down power structure. Uh, and, and Emily and I were uh, exchanging emails about this. I don't have all the answers. I said, as I said before, we, we have evidence that the, uh, the people, the men who were overseers tried to turn it into a, a village competition. This is the, the the group of the frog. This is the group of the pig and so on. We still see some of their graffiti they left behind celebrating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is us. We're so cool. But of course, the other thing is once you are committed to the idea that we're working for the son of God, then maybe you get a little more accurate. Yeah. And maybe it becomes a little more of a passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the context for that discussion was that if you look at the bureaucracies we see today, efficiency is not the word that comes to mind. No, no it's but not. But when you leverage the spirit of competition and the religious significance, it uh, ups your game a little bit. Yeah. And I, I almost wonder as well if part of the potential benefits listed for those who would work on these pyramids, in addition to the practical benefits like a, like a worker, a government work program and all that, but... You know, when you die, you have to go weigh your soul in front of the crocodile headed mm. god. <laughs> yeah. And you know, if depending on on how quickly this pyramid gets up, we can uh, we can help lighten <laughs> your feather a little bit. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And there are a lot of graves in the vicinity of the Great Pyramid. Maybe that was another part of the deal. Another perk. A little yeah. churchyard there. Yeah. You 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 bet you 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 too will receive the benefits of this. Just 
Apparently, the, the pyramid has a proximity effect. For yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, in magic, such things do happen. Mm -hmm. Here's a, a quote from, from uh, Mendelssohn's book. He says this, Once it's realized that the main object of pyramid construction was a work program leading to a new social order, the religious meaning and ritual importance of the pyramid recede into the background. If anything, these man-made mountains are a monument to the progress of man into a new pattern of life, the national state, which was to become his social home for the next 5,000 years. Uh, his dating's off, but you get the idea. Look at the, you know, the trick of the magician, the stage magician, is he, he lifts his left hand and wiggles his fingers, and we all look up at the left hand. Meanwhile, the right hand. I remember even as a kid, I had learned this, and there was a, a magician at the, at the county fair. And I saw the magician lift up his hand, and I immediately looked at the other hand. Sure enough, that's where things <laughs> were happening. And it spoiled everything. It's like, well, so much for the Aww. magic on that one. <laughs> Guy was a bad magician, but he, he got caught too easily. But this is, this is the nature of people who are creating their new vision of a state, Watch this hand, which is full of promises and hope and the wonderful things that you will get now and that you will get later, that your children will get. And don't notice the other hand that's yanking in your freedom step by step and redesigning you and your thought patterns mm -hmm. to be something very different from what you were. And I think we could, without much effort, plug in 1984, Fahrenheit, uh, 451, and... Um, Gulag Archipelago. World. Yeah, moving into history as opposed to fantasy. Mendelssohn says the pyramids do not represent an aim in itself, but the means to achieve an end, the creation of a new form of society. These huge heaps of stone mark a place where man invented the state. Well, I think that's a little over the top because we already have Sumer and we know what was going on there. Uh, but uh, Egypt, the pyramids endure because of the sand and the dryness, and we can still look at this and marvel at what men did once upon a time and ask the question, why? Because you know what? We wouldn't do that because we're not that impressed by huge amounts of stone. Sure, we'll look at, we'll watch a special on it, mm -hmm. but we, nobody is interested. Hey, we're going to build one of those in downtown Sacramento, name a city. And we want people to come and volunteer to be part of this. Okay, if you're talking two or three hours, you might get a lot of people. You're talking half a year. Oh, and we'll pay you. Well, actually, we won't pay you. We'll just give you food and a place to sleep for the night. No one's going to go except maybe some homeless people, probably not them. Because our priorities have shifted. But when you start talking about new forms of technology appropriate to our age, then things change a little bit. There are things that we, in our age, want to be involved in. Space program comes to mind. Yeah. And it's interesting, going back to what you were talking about, it's, it's, it's interesting to see it being privatized yeah. in, your, in your generation. Yeah, we just had the SpaceX launch last Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday see before sent a few, last. Sent a few folks up to the ISS. We'll see if they can keep it private and if there is, in fact, at this point in our historical development, enough economic demand for whatever we can do with that to keep mm -hmm. it going. In the 60s, it was a sheer power statement. We can reach the moon. We can do it by the end of this decade. Also a subtle nod. We have the rocket boosters capable of making it all the way to the moon. How much easier do you think Russia is going to be? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the whole space race was a subset of the Cold War, and and a statement about how great America is, and and a prod to our educational system and all that. But in terms of what actually came out of it, there, there were some things that came out of it, which probably would have we would have gotten to eventually in a free market, uh, with a lot less risk to human life. So you know, I'm a child of the space age. I I watched all the the, the liftoffs. I watched the moon landing. Yes, I was alive then. Uh, one of those one of those events where everybody knows where they were. They were in front of a, t a TV. That's where they were <laughs> when Neil Armstrong stepped on the moon. But it's interesting that it took something aimed at the heavens to get to garner that kind of attention. 
mm-hmm. because the only other thing it really has has been wars. Mm-hmm. But the 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 ability of people in power to abandon the free market and to hand some kind of big, great, wonderful, we're all in this, let's spend lots and lots of money on it, and you commit a lot, a lot of your time and energy to it, and we will be great together. Don't look at the man behind the curtain and don't watch to see which of your freedoms are evaporating in the process or how your own mindset has been changing in the in the wake of these uh, recent um, demonstrations and riots, which are two different things. Yes. Or however, capable, a couple, they may be a point. It's one thing to protest. It's another thing to behave wickedly and to break the law. Mm. Uh, it has been amazing how many Christians have not been able to make that distinction mm-hmm. because their mindset is, well, they're oppressed people. They have the right to burn down buildings and steal stuff and break stuff. No, yeah. they don't. But you obviously have been listening to informational sources for a long time that have convinced you that they do. Mm-hmm. And that should frighten you more than you probably are frightened. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, this is great. Let's get to some recos before we sign off. Greg, would you like to go first? I think yours is relevant to this discussion. So why don't you wrap us? Give yeah. it a wrap. Uh, my recommendation is a book by Gary North. It's part of a set, but you can it stands very nicely by itself. It's called Moses and Pharaoh, Dominion Religion versus Power Religion. He also had read Mendelssohn, although I came to Mendelssohn by a very different route. He also mentions uh, an important writer named Lewis Mumford, who writes about the place of uh, machinery and architecture in in sociology, uh, and that would be someone else to pursue. But let me um, let me read you just one quote. Uh, let's see, and this I think is from Mumford. He says this. See if it makes sense without me laying down any more context. This extension of magnitude in every direction, this raising of the ceiling of human effort, this subordination of individual aptitudes and interests to the mechanical job in hand, and this unification of a multitude of subordinates to a single end that derived from the divine power exercised by the king, in turn, by the success of the result, confirmed that power. For note, it was the king who uttered the original commands. It was the king who demanded absolute obedience and punished disobedience with torture, mutilation, or death. It was the king who alone had the godlike power of turning live men into dead mechanical objects, that is, cogs in a machine. And finally, it was the king who assembled the parts to form the machine and imposed a new discipline of mechanical organization with the same regularity that moved the heavenly bodies on their undeviating course. No vegetation god, no fertility myth could produce this kind of cold abstract order, this detachment of power from life. Only one empowered by the sun god could remove all hitherto respected norms or limits of human endeavor. Uh, That's Mumford. And his, whereas Mendelssohn's willing to allow for that spark of camaraderie and almost uh, fraternal order, we're the tur- we're the turtles. You're the pigs. We can beat you. You know, uh, <laughs> Mumford's idea is no. You this requires the dehumanization of man, and we certainly have seen that in in bureaucracy in the twentieth and now the twenty first century, where men literally do become well, not literally, but extremely figuratively to the point that it seems literal. Uh, cogs in a machine where they are paper pushers, and you ask some people, "What's your job?" Well, I'm just kind of a paper pusher. Uh, that's not what God made you to be. But when you have someone who is the son of the divine son and who can most literally torture you for your bureaucratic screw-ups, there's another element we didn't talk about. It's one thing to serve the divine son. It's another thing to actually know that your best friend was taken out and ripped in pieces because he Mm. was off by a millimeter or two. But anyway, there's uh, there's this is from uh, Gary North's chapter Imperial Bureaucracy, um, and uh, we have um, population growth as a tool of dominion, imperial bureaucracy, rigorous waste, a legitimate state power. Uh, also, a discussion of the chronology of ancient Egypt, which we will be coming to talk about at some point. So uh, it pursues some of the same things we've talked about tonight. So Moses and Pharaoh, Dominion Religion versus Power Religion. All right. 
Thanks. Brian? So I'm going to recommend the works of the late Sir Terry Pratchett, who was a brilliant British satirical fantasy author. Uh, if you're looking for a quick read just to introduce yourself to the works, I would recommend Good Omens, which he co-wrote with Neil Gaiman. But my personal favorite series is from his Discworld Saga series, whatever you wish to term it. They're all fairly easy to hop into in the middle because they're written at a very popular, engaging level. My personal favorite subseries is called the Night Watch series, which features the bumbling cast of the um, the city Night Watch for the central city that all of the stories take most of the stories take place in. And I'm going to read a quote from the book Snuff, which, according to the citation here, is the 39th Discworld book. So if you start the series, you will have <laughs> so plenty he's of a material. Prolific writer. <laughs> yes, it says. Cheery was aware that Commander Vimes didn't like the phrase, the innocent have nothing to fear, rather believing the innocent had everything to fear, mostly from the guilty, but in the longer term, even more from those who say things like, the innocent have nothing to fear. <laughs> oh, man. Relevant Snaps. in all times. <laughs> there is another story. Unfortunately, I cannot remember the name, Brian, but maybe you'll recognize it. It, it opens with the power of story as a metaphysical thing. Story mm -hmm. is something that will lay hold on characters and shape them inevitably into what it wants them to be. And there's no good trying to fight story. It's about some witches. I don't remember anything beyond that. Uh, if, it, it, if it's from the witches, I haven't read any of those ones. There, uh, there's a specific sub-story okay, line. Okay, sub-story. Yeah. Uh, but his, his discussion of, of story plot mm -hmm. as being something inevitable I thought was a lot of fun and then along the line he does introduce characters from other novels and and fairy tales and such at one point I think we see Gollum trying to swim and catch up <laughs> with a boat in the river and they hit him over the head with an oar or something uh, so yeah he's uh, a lot of fun my my other personal favorite line from him uh, has to do with the discussion of bookstores and how they are metaphysical other places of reality. Uh, <laughs> and he specifically makes the point, he says, if, if knowledge is power, then it's like books or words equal knowledge, knowledge equals power, power equals energy, and energy equals mass, thanks to Einstein. <laughs> so when you have a bunch of books in one location, they actually distort space-time to such a point <laughs> that it connects to other book stores in different realities. And if you've ever come across a bookstore owner or librarian who just seemed a little bit odd, as though he wasn't quite from this part of town, the odds are that he's not from this world either. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I've known a couple of those bookstore owners. Okay, that puts <laughs> things in a very different perspective. Yeah, indeed. That's very, very uh, iconic of Terry Pratchett is this whimsical way that he plays with physics and magic <laughs> together. Yes, it's really fun. One one of the things that I I've always I've also really enjoyed about Pratchett is is that uh, magic is a lot closer to um what the bible talks about as magic because it's more chaotic and uncontrollable there's none mm. of this two plus two equals four nonsense that you find <laughs> in other books um it is it's like okay you have all these wizards working on magic and even they don't know how it's going to turn out because <laughs> they've been studying it long enough and they know that it's just it's unpredictable and, and chaos just magic is chaos <laughs> <laughs> all right emily what's yours yeah. i'm going to recommend one rereading because I am rereading my favorite book, which I'm about to recommend. But the act of rereading, I have found to be very fruitful. You get to see things that you didn't see before. Sometimes you judge your former tastes as being correct, sometimes as incorrect. In this case, my case that I'm about to recommend, it has been very correct, more correct than I ever knew. I am rereading Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre. Uh, it was my favorite book through junior high and high school. I probably read it four or five times during those years. Haven't read it since then, which is quite a while, but it's so much better than I remembered. I've apparently learned to read during the intervening <laughs> years. And especially in light of our recent conversations about Beauty and the Beast and 
resurrection themes and transformation themes. And oh, look, there's an Esau character. It's just been wonderful. So Charlotte Bronte's Jane Eyre, oldie but a goodie, do recommend. Um, your learning how to read strikes a nerve with me. I just had my students read Crime and Punishment, something I mentioned last time. And the one of the final questions for the book was, uh, Dostoevsky is supposedly a Christian writer. Do, do you perceive this book to, in some sense, be a Christian book? There, Most people, most of my students said, well, maybe a little in that he, the guy knows he's guilty and deserves to be punished, but that's about it. I mean, it's not like there's any mention of, I mean, sure, the, the prostitute has a cross she tries to give him, but beyond that, there's really nothing else going on here that would make it Christian in any way, shape, or form. So I'm going to have to go with, no, it's not, oh. guys. <laughs> okay, first this of all. This is the result of bad <laughs> Christian movies. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, okay, so this generation has been spoiled by the presence of Christian music labels, Christian publishing houses, Christian movies. Like, we can just have good books and movies and music. Like, <laughs> I'm, I'm but, just very but, angry about it. And, I, and this is certainly true, but in Crime and Punishment, uh, what, in fact, what one of the students said, this can't possibly be Christian because right up front, he puts you in the head of a murderer. And before you know it, you're sympathizing with the murderer, and you start <laughs> you start hoping that he's going to get away with this. So that couldn't be Christian. Have you met Christianity? <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a big point of it. Yeah, I'm just thinking of you know Romans chapter. So what is it? Seven. Um, I'm thinking of oh, <laughs> you think you're better than the murderer? Interesting. Yes, yeah. interesting. Exactly. I would never do that. Oh, really? Uh, now. <laughs> And then they completely overlook some of the most blatant Christian language when one of the one of the characters turns to Rishkolnikov and says, Do you believe in the resurrection of Lazarus? Literally. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I do. Do you believe in the New Jerusalem? Why are you asking me? Do you believe in it? Yes, I do. And so at the end, we're looking for resurrection people. <laughs> And because he's only barely there on the last page, which which uh, Dostoevsky tells us, this is nothing, that would belong to another story. But this story <laughs> is over. You want everything signed, sealed, and delivered. You know the conversion has to take place by chapter three, or you don't have a Christian book. You can't have a Christian book that simply says, "This is what sin is like." And this is how we try to deal with it in our self-justification. Mm. And God uses many means to begin to push us toward repentance and reality. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, yeah, uh, rereading yeah. is a good thing. And sometimes books that we thought were a complete waste, if we go back when our theology is a little better, we may find we're actually treasure troves of wisdom. Yeah. So I have to ask, as a, as a once and future teacher myself, I hope, as a teacher... Are you kind of like, what should I have said to these students to help well, them understand this? Or was that not really yeah, the point of the class? No, no. Here, here, here's the thing. Remember what's been going on for more than two months now? Oh, the coronavirus. Virtual school. Yeah. yeah it's not the ideal situation. For no, school. it's not. We had like unto no discussions because everything was here, read this, here, answer this question. And I hope that I can phrase the question in such a way that you will stop and think and realize that maybe you're not reading it right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. the, the first question I asked or first or second was, so how did you, how did it feel to you to be in the mind of a murderer? And did you find yourself sympathizing and what happened once you realized you were and what happened? And did you get mad at the author? <laughs> and if you did, did you realize that he no doubt foresaw that and deliberately planned for you to get mad at him? So he's still <laughs> manipulating you. Um, and I no, had the hardest. Dostoevsky wasn't a classical <laughs> genius or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I had the hardest time getting the kids to even understand the question. They mm -hmm. wanted to step back into third person and say, "Well, authors often do this with their readers." No, that's not what I ask you. <laughs> I ask you what happened to you when you read this, mm -hmm. and that was hard for them to bring it down to. Oh, and, and some admitted, "Yeah, I really sympathize," and some. 
you know, so I sympathized to the point of trying to figure out how he could escape. <laughs> Others were, I, can't, I did sympathize knowing it was wrong, nonetheless, feeling sorry for him. But a few souls said, no, at no point did I ever feel sorry for him <laughs> because obviously he's a murderer and needs to go to, and needs to be executed and go to hell. Okay, well, so as you say, obviously you are of a wholly different nature than this murderer would never do anything sinful that required the mercy of God. Hmm. Okay, Javert. <laughs> anyway, so yes, let us let us recommend a rereading and include Jane Eyre mm-hmm. within the many things that we need to reread, or in my case, read for the first time because like you, it is my wife's favorite book and I never quite got around to it. Although I've seen multiple movies. There's there's <laughs> one good movie. There's one good movie. I'll say that. And after I finish this reread, I'm going to watch it again to see if I still like it. To see if, uh... <laughs> so there's also rewatching. Yes, yes, also rewatching mm. to bring which, judgment upon my former tastes. For the the sake of anyone who happens to be listening, which movie is this? Is the true version? Uh, the Timothy Dalton miniseries. Ah. Mm-hmm. Yes, good to know. I've seen that. Yeah, now you know. Yeah. And that's a wrap on this episode. So thank you guys so much for being here and having this conversation. Thank you to our financial supporters. If you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. If you'd like to send us an email, you can do that. Join in the conversation, halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Uh, next week, we'll be talking about Moses, the Prince of Egypt. Speaking of rewatching films, <laughs> hope to see you next time. 